good morning to you. It's Friday already. I cannot believe it. I'm excited to bring us in on today's program of the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, I'm Mike Miano. I believe most of you are familiar with me if you're tuned into this Preterist Power Hour. We do encourage you, of course, to visit Preterist, uh, I'm sorry, powerofpreterism.com, which is a website that tells you a bit more about the Power of Preterism Network, uh, which I have the privilege of being a part of. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and I'll hand it over to you, Edward. Good morning, and allow you to introduce yourself. So say whatever you will, and then if you don't mind, please lead us in a word of prayer. Good morning. My name is Edward Howell. It's a privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano. I welcome all all of you viewers. Hopefully that you will be uh, empowered, you know, throughout this hour, and that you know you will be provoked for conversation and and uh, dialogue with one another in these matters that you may develop and grow in your spiritual understanding and in the manifold wisdom of God. Now I'd like to open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us, open our eyes, ears, minds, and hearts that we may be able to receive that which you may have for us and that uh, you would bless pastor with clarity of thought, proper focus, and that you know uh, we'll all be edified throughout this time period. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, again, I, I want to express appreciation for you and for those of you that have continued to be a part of our dialogue, uh, whether it's here live on Zoom uh, or those of you that have watched and sent messages or, or posted feedback comments in the comment box. Thank you for being a part of this study. I do know that uh, God is glorified through this effort, and I know many have expressed being edified uh, through this effort as well. So uh, all glory to God in that regard. So, uh, Edward, uh, here we are. We're, we've been reviewing this topic of the second exodus. And if I may say, today's, uh, by the way, I want to bring us in on flashback, flash forward Friday. So what that ultimately means here on the Preterist Power Hour is that uh, by the end of our program, we'll share some resources and announcements uh, with you uh, that we believe will help you be edified in, the, in future months and in future times. Uh, that's one thing, Edward, you know that I've talked about this, my frustration in the Preterist community is that we don't have a cohesiveness in regards to announcements, conferences, and then people end up saying months out, I wish I would have known or I, if I only would have known. So what we've desired to do with this morning program is also provide every Friday at, at least, but also every day, uh, provide a way to share announcements and resources and uh, different things in that regard. So I'm excited to share some thoughts at the end of today's program uh, in that regard. If I may, uh, I want to share two quotes with you that I found in my time hop this morning, meaning quotes that I shared in years past that, in my estimation, lead us in on discussion that we've been having. The first one is from Charles Spurgeon. Many of you might be familiar with him. He was the uh, quote unquote prince of preachers, right? Uh, he was a preacher in London, and he had said this, I will follow scripture wherever they may lead me, and I will announce the most cherished opinion." rather than shape or alter a single syllable of God's book. So again, here we are, we're, we're desiring to walk worthy of what the scriptures are revealing to us so that we might best understand and have that cherished opinion uh, in regards to God's holy word. Uh, then R.T. France, very good scholar, teacher, uh, if you look him up on Google, uh, you know, he, he's his works are astounding. You know, he did, he accomplished a lot. And he passed away a, a bit recently, I believe in 2019 or 2020. I might be wrong on the dating. Either way, this is what he had shared. Uh, he said, where Jesus used symbolic language of the Old Testament, it is perverse to look for literal application of his words. I thought that was a, a great one that we've uh, discussed here on the Preterist Power Hour. And I found those two quotes to be uh, edifying. What do you think, Edward? Well, I, I, I was thinking as uh, uh, is it Charles Spurgeon? Yeah. Uh, his of uh, of uh, uh, the response of an individual's understanding of a word, uh, he holds it at such great value. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm thinking that it is it, you know is very important that we that people share like their understanding of what's what what they've been taught or what they've heard. That way, you know, you can see basically, did they get the intended message? Right. 
or you know, or what are they hearing? You know, what what lens are they you know receiving it through? Sure. You know, things of this nature. You know, it's very important. Again, and you've you've highlighted that, and I believe that's very important to challenge our paradigm to you know acknowledge that we all have paradigms that we've developed mm -hmm. from different places and sources, et cetera, and we need to challenge that and and understand why it is we're putting together the pieces, and then of course ask ourselves, is it true? Does it actually lay out? And I believe that what we've been doing here with this topic, the second exodus, actually helps us understand that, right? Uh, as we recognized, uh, if I may bring everybody's attention back to the Feast of the Lord, uh, a reference I've been saying again and again is that I believe that this is as foundational as that resource. And I want to explain why. We know that across the, the board, Christian, or let's start with Jewish, Jewish minds, the rabbis, et cetera, understood that the Feast of, the, of Israel pointed to what God was ultimately doing with his people. So they believed that those, those uh, feasts would be fulfilled by the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we often call, there's a word for this, and we're, I'm going to lead in on this in a little bit here, uh, about typology. You know, again, uh, the, you know, understanding uh, the shadows, the types and the shadows uh, found in scripture. We alluded to this, Zach actually mentioned it uh, on yesterday's program, and I wanted to kind of outline that word uh, on our program today. So I'll do that in a moment. Uh, however, um, my point is, is that what we've been doing is, is hopefully uh, showing everyone an outline that's found in scripture, uh, the second Exodus, and then leading in on how do we understand that as applied to uh, the things of scripture, to, the, to what we're reading in scripture and have, asking ourselves, is it consistent? And my point, going back to what I was saying about the Feast of the Lord, if Christian scholars across the board believe, uh, just as the rabbis did, et cetera, that the feasts of the Lord demonstrate Christ's work. And most scholars, as we noted, uh, believe that the, the spring feasts were representative of Christ's earthly ministry, right? What he had done on earth. And then we know in Hebrews, it says that he, uh, in the days of his flesh, contrasting his going into glory. And uh, then it, we know that what he began to do in the fall feasts was his eschatological end time work. And we noted that there's an inconsistency with a lot of futurists where they have just kind of artificially inserted a gap between the fulfillment of the fall feasts without recognizing how they pointed to things that happened right there in the first century and how we can understand these fall feasts within that 40 year generation as being fulfilled uh, you know, as, a, as an understanding of eschatology. So I say that because what we're doing here with the second exodus is the same point, that if you understand the first exodus and the imagery being used throughout the prophets, and then you understand how the New Testament authors, uh, the, the inspired writers of the New Testament were using that imagery to apply to Christ and his messianic work, then it leads us to continue to ask, was the second exodus fulfilled? Or are we somehow in exile same as, in the same way that the old covenant people were in exile, uh, waiting for the time of the Messiah? How did we get pushed back rather than seeing the, the fulfillment as consistent? Because again, uh, many of the resources that I've shared and even some I'm going to share today, they understand the Exodus motif. They understand this imagery. They understand the type, if you will, but then and the anti-type being the Messiah, but then they, they misapply it. And I think that's why we, we've offered this up for study. And hopefully it's been beneficial to people in that regard. Amen. Amen, brother. Uh, and again, if I, if I talk too long, you know, as I mentioned to you off the air, I, I drink a lot of coffee in the morning. So if I go on a rant, you know, jump in, brother. Always feel free. You know, that's... Okay, because I did want to mention about the fall <laughs> feast, about how they, how the year 70 in history should be held at a higher regard than it is instead of you know just a time in history that something had occurred and that future events is going to occur that supposedly is going to trump the seven the year 70 which is not a possibility because year 70 is a fulfillment of all things because in the fall in the fall feast the trumpet you know judgment happened in 70 AD the atonement uh, Jesus being, you know, our propit propitiation, uh, and then um, uh, the people, uh, the dead raised, the 
uh, the uh, sleep uh, gathered and the people that were wait, uh, that were living were changed, all gathered when Jesus had come back to whereas he's tabernacling with us, you know? So all of these, you know, had occurred at that period, you know? So uh, that, that shows that all things have been fulfilled you know, the fall feast had to had occurred because if you look at 70, the year 70, you know, and, and if you recognize it as judgment, you know, you know that that trumpet has been blown, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the atonement had to occur for us to have that righteousness in which we so, you know, lavishly, you know, indulge in <laughs> and things right. of this nature, That's you know, right. and God being with us, you know, forever. Amen. Amen. Well said, brother. You know, uh, Hebrews 9, 28, right? We had to have that high priest come out a second time to bring the salvation that we celebrate. You said that very well, and I appreciate uh, you outlining the, the fulfillment of those feasts, because again, that's what we're showing people ultimately through the what I call the power of preterism, that if we're consistent with, you know, again, there's points where hopefully we can agree that, you know, the feasts point to the work of Christ here in this regard with the second exodus. Hopefully we can agree that, and we're going to see that actually today as we move into the New Testament a bit, um, we're going to see where the New Testament applies this imagery to Christ and his work in the first century and that generation, if you will. So, um, Edward, do you have, would you have a way that you would explain that word typology? Are you familiar with that phrase? Yes. Typology, like, um, like, uh, uh, like you have sh shadows and then you have the fulfillments. Um, the type, the type would be uh, a picture of the anti-type that would, would occur later on. Okay, right. Yeah, good, good example. So you have a shadow and then you have that which is actually casting the shadow, which is the substance. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. That's, that's the way we would use that in a good, good explanation there of type. So what I want to show you is how that would be understood in the New Testament uh, as applying to Christ and his work, just so people can see our hermeneutic, if you will, why we're understanding this first exodus that, again, we encourage people to watch our previous sessions where we went through. We talked about the actual exodus. We even understood Genesis as applying to a story there of, of exodus and exile and uh, covenant, if you will. And then we've been understanding, we basically went through the whole Old Testament and marked out Hosea, Zechariah, Isaiah uh, as different texts that allude to the uh, use or use Exodus imagery. So that being said, I want to offer up our why we're saying this applies to Christ and his messianic work in the first century. The first text is the text that I mentioned yesterday in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to go ahead and turn there. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, talking, again, we know that at Corinth, there were Jews and Gentiles, and that's why he can start out this text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, and he says, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from that spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, I read all of that to show you where Paul is saying our ancestors. So he's alluding to Israel's history, obviously speaking to Jews. And then he goes on to say here in verse 6, now these things occurred as examples or types or shadows to keep us from setting our hearts on things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. And he goes on, but at the point I want to show here is in verse 11, he repeats the same point. These things happen to them as examples, or types, or shadows, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Now, who are the us? The us are the Jews and the Gentiles that are gathered together at Corinth in the first century, and not just those at Corinth, but those, again, we know the end was coming upon that generation. Time texts are very clear in that regard. So what Paul is saying is that 
he's applying the imagery of the Exodus to that first century and saying that, you know, they were experiencing those, those things. And another text I want to bring us to just to further lead in on this topic of types and shadows is John chapter one. with me one moment here in john chapter 1 verse 17 and here we read for the law was given through moses grace and truth came through jesus christ so again we see moses being pictured with you know the the, the substance or something other i like the interpretation true grace the law came through moses which was a grace in and of itself but true grace came through Jesus Christ. So again, you're seeing the contrast of these two covenants. Uh, furthermore, if you go to chapter three, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So again, what is the author of John doing? He's taking the picture of Moses' day and applying it to Christ and his saving work. In Matthew chapter 12, sorry, we're bouncing around a bit here, but I put my notes together in this way for a reason, I believe. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be in the heart of the earth for three. So the son of man for three days and three nights will be in the heart of the earth. So again, my point here is showing you how the author of Ma Matthew here is applying imagery of Jonah to Jesus Christ, saying that that was imagery in the prophetic text and we're applying it to Jesus Christ. Uh, another text would be Colossians chapter two. This one's a bit more, uh, you know, straightforward. Colossians chapter 2, verse 17. And here we read, well, I'm going to start at verse 16. Uh, after all the points, obviously, he's been making in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, those of you familiar with my ministry know I love therefores in scripture, so I'm always going to bring it up. Uh, verse 16 says, therefore, meaning everything that I've said before this, do not let anyone judge you by what, you've, what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow, again, a type, a shadow, an example of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So again, there's a text that basically says it for us, you know, what we're doing here and what we're saying. Uh, a couple other texts, if you don't mind, uh, would be Romans chapter 5, verse 14. And I mentioned this because we're actually going to talk a bit about Romans 5 through 8 here in a moment. Uh, Romans 5.14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So again, the author of Romans, Paul, and we know Paul also does this in 1 Corinthians 15, He's applying Adam as a type and Christ as the substance, as the anti-type. Adam was the shadow. He was the example. He was the type. Christ is the substance. He is the anti-type. He is the, 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 you know, the, the fulfillment, if you will, uh, not the example. In Hebrews chapter 8, again, I believe in Pauline authorship. That's another uh, topic for another time. Uh, Ed Stevens's resources tend to be the, my favorite on, on that, in that regard. Um, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, we read, They serve as a sanctuary, that they serve at a sanctuary, again, talking about the high priests, that is a copy, a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So again, what's happening in the book of Hebrews, if you properly understand the text, is it's contrasting the old to the new. 
and the old being physical, being identified with present day Jerusalem at that time, and the new being non-physical, being unseen, coming without observation, being in the midst of God's people. In other words, the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the, the, you know, the uh, saving work of Jesus Christ. So that being said, this text is pointing out that that old covenant sanctuary, that old covenant high priest system was a shadow, a copy. They, they gave us another text here in the NIV. Uh, so we have example, a copy, a type, or a shadow. Uh, that was the old covenant picture. So then the fulfillment of those things, uh, what would be the opposite of a copy? What original you, print, original. The original, all right, there, there you go, amen. He is the alpha and the omega. So uh, <laughs> the original, right? So then you have Christ being the original, the substance, the fulfillment, and the antitype. So, you know, hopefully we're seeing that. That's what we're talking about here. When we're understanding the feasts of the Lord, we're understanding the second exodus, these types uh, that are this typology, you know, typology, again, I've heard different pronunciations of the word. Um, that's what we're, we're working out. Another text, I have two more texts, three more texts, if you don't mind, here in the book of Hebrews to just illustrate this point. Uh, I know I'm way beyond my two or three witnesses at this point. Uh, however, uh, I think it's important to just show some of these texts. In Hebrews 9.9, 9, it says, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Continuing into verse 10, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So uh, there you have it. You know, these are illustrations, another text. Uh, an illustration is obviously, uh, it's being, again, the substance is Christ. So it's like the shadow, you know, an illustration is similar to a shadow. It's the copy of something as we're talking about. So we're seeing all these different words being used, uh, contrasting the old to the new. And that's going to be important because when we come to understand what the second Exodus is talking about, we need to stay within line of understanding the messianic work. If that's what we're saying, the typology is pointing out that it's the messianic work of Christ. We're not at liberty to begin adding other stuff to that that is outside the confines of understanding what the, the imagery would say, you know, how that imagery would be carried out consistently. Uh, here in chapter 10, verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. Uh, when I read that, a text I often think about, and I believe we alluded, yes, we alluded to this text yesterday, is 1 Peter chapter 1. If you remember in 1 Peter 1, it talks about the salvation that the, the scattered saints were receiving through Jesus Christ, that they would... Um, that as they were receiving that salvation, it's a, what it also talks about. It says the, the things that were happening through Christ and the glories to follow. So the suffering of Christ, yes, the crucifixion of Christ, yes. However, also the glories that would follow. Uh, and that's what I think about here where it says the good things that are coming. And obviously we know that that was when you understand the fall feasts that we were talking about before, you begin to understand what those things that were coming that they were expecting uh, throughout what a Hebrew Christian, if you will, would have been understand uh, under would, would have understood uh, as to happen one last text that we're just to kind of keep illustrating this point uh, hebrews 11 19 and here we read abraham reasoned that god could even raise the dead and so in a manner of speaking he received isaac back from the dead why did i mark this text out Sorry, one, if you give me one moment here. It does say as a type. Where? At the end of uh, 19, the last, the last uh, line. 1119, huh? Yes. That's interesting. My text does not say it. If you don't mind, can you read 1119 according to the translation you're reading? Sure. This is the NASB. Uh, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also receives him back as a type. Uh, okay, yeah. So unfortunately, the NIV does take liberties. Uh, as you know, some people have joked uh, the nearly inspired version. 
uh, as the, uh, properly uh, uh, one way to understand NIV. But again, so well, what we're seeing there- King James, King James used the word figure. Figure, right, exactly. That's another word that we could use. <laughs> yes. uh, a figure being an example, a type, uh, you know, a shadow. So what we see there is the, the author of Hebrews showing that what was happening with Abraham was happening as an, an example. I think that's probably the best way to understand that uh, of what Christ was ultimately the fulfillment of. And we talked yeah. about that with Daniel Rogers. I think that's been a consistent theme, uh, understanding the, that the Exodus, the original Exodus, was a fulfillment of Abrahamic promise. And then ultimately what's being fulfilled through Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of what was being uh, the promises to Abraham, which again, I believe the book of Galatians leans in on that discussion very well. Because the thing with uh, Isaac being sacrificed, uh, rather Jacob, let me see. Yeah, Jake, uh, Isaac is Jacob's son, right? Yes. Okay, he, he was he was going to be the sacrifice. So God wouldn't ask you to oh, do something you would not do yourself. Okay, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac Jacob is Isaac's son. Yes. Okay, he was to be that sacrifice at that time, right? And then when God put back his hand, he gave him a, a, a ram that was caught in, in um, the thing. vines or something. He was caught up in vines or something. And he used that, that, that lamb, that, that ram that was caught in the vines as that sacrifice. Now, Jesus also being the lamb of God, you know, that could be a type in that regard. Absolutely. And then God uh, having him sacrifice his son God sacrificed his son, That's you right. know, so, you know, that, that could be that type and that figure as well. That's right. So again, and I think most Christians agree with that. However, they don't follow through with, you know, consistently understanding, well, then how do this, does this second Exodus, for example, how does this imagery follow through? And I think we'll lead in on that here uh, in our discussion. So if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of lean us over to uh, talking about that topic, uh, the, the second Exodus a bit more, continuing our discussion. Now, if I may say this before we jump right into it, again, today we wanna look at some New Testament texts. Um, one of the things I wanna mention is that uh, this is a continued conversation. By no means uh, do we think that we'll exhaust this topic, you know, and that that's, that, it, that's not even an attempt that I'm, I'm endeavoring to make. Uh, that being said, We've provided quite a few resources, which again, as you know, Edward, are impossible to get through for in one week. Uh, we provided uh, one that I'm currently listening to, a whole series on exile. Uh, again, another word for Exodus. Um, you know, they have a whole series. The Bible Project has a whole podcast series, and I started at podcast number one. And even listening right there in number one, I realized, oh boy, there's a whole bunch of differences because again, they believe that their second they've recognized the error that most Christians have uh, in regards to, they believe the second Exodus is leaving this, this, this planet and going to heaven. So many have recognized that's not true. So what they've ended up doing is they've redefined it to be, well, no, it's about being on a, a restored planet. So what they're waiting for, rather than saying it's about dying and going to heaven, they're saying it's about the Exodus that we're waiting for still to be fulfilled is a restored planet. And you and I know the problem with that type of theology and what, you know, that, that's the problem with misapplying and misunderstanding the, the, the details of the second exodus. So again, I encourage everyone review those resources, but then ask yourself, why have I come to an understanding that differs than that? And then do that study. You know, I think it could be very beneficial. I've also so provided- Consider the word arrets. Hmm? They need to consider the word arrets, Abraham. Sure. Right, for the word world and land. Absolutely, that's, I, I do think that's a very important- uh, concept there uh, that needs to be taken in. If you don't mind, Edward, I'm just going to share a video from the Bible Project. I thought their video was a bit encouraging uh, and helped us kind of helps us outline this topic a little bit. And uh, that being said, I'm also going to be sharing uh, another resource from uh, the preaching source where they get in on the new and greater Exodus and they get in on some points uh, that I thought were very beneficial. I'll share that actually here in a moment after I share this video. So uh, please enjoy this video and uh, we'll be right back. There's something about being home, where everything's just right, 
We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disorienting. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story, how they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Um, they didn't, and they were sent into exile. And if you still don't see the parallel between exile from the garden and exile from Israel, think about this. In Genesis, humanity's exile led up to the story about the building of what city? Oh yeah, Babylon. The same place the Israelites are sent. But that's not the end of either story. In the first Babylon, God called Abraham to leave and travel to the Promised Land. And that story was designed to give hope to the Israelites currently living in the later Babylon. Now eventually, they do get to leave and travel back to their promised homeland. And when they did, it wasn't home sweet home. Oppressive empires were still ruling over them, and the people kept acting in the same corrupt ways as their ancestors. And so the biblical prophets said that exile wasn't actually over. How could they think they were still in exile when they're at home? Yeah, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more no matter where you live. Yeah, I, I can relate to this. I have a great home, but it's situated in a world scarred with pain and broken relationships, death, tragedy, done by others, but also done by me. And so in the Bible, exile is the human condition. We all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where you live, we are all longing for a better home. Now Israel's scriptures held out hope that one day God would send a king who would rescue the world from all of the Babylons we've created. And after many generations pass, we meet this Israelite named Jesus of Nazareth. He wandered about with no home, announcing the great restoration, that reality of home that Israel and all humanity has been looking for. Yeah, Jesus really cared about people who didn't have homes. He welcomed in the stranger. He said God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus also claimed that Israel and all humanity had lost its way that our self-centeredness drives us to create false homes based on status and power, and these inevitably exclude others. We live in an exile of our own making. But Jesus said the true way home is one of weakness, of service, and of forgiveness. And then Jesus went into exile alongside us to show us the true way home. Which is? Well, Jesus said he is the way. His life and self-giving love proved more powerful than humanity's failure. He opened up a pathway to our real home. And as Jesus' followers committed themselves to him, they discovered this new way of being human. They believed that the real return from exile had begun. And so they would call themselves sojourners or wanderers. Oh right, they would say things like, the world isn't our home and we're citizens of heaven. And so Jesus' followers remain exiles as they wait for that day when Jesus returns to transform this world into a true home. Okay, so obviously- Hey there, everybody. Uh, Thank you for watching this video about the exile. It's one of our theme videos that we make at the Bible Project. We make a lot more videos. Well, we're glad they appreciate us watching it. Now, uh, that being said, um, I'm sure you noticed that there was a lot of 
interesting things they brought out, things that we've mentioned, things that we would probably agree with, uh, and then also things that where they take the story we might not agree with. And obviously with the eschatological view of, you know, obviously we know one of the big problems and it pointed out exactly what you said before, uh, their misunderstanding of the word a restored earth, a restored, you know, what was God saying about his restored promised land, if you will. And, uh, you know, obviously they seem to lead in on it, if you noticed, because they said, Jesus said the way to that, that, you know, that city, the way to that promise uh, the, the way to that kingdom was through him. So we don't believe that Jesus is a literal yellow street that's going to, you know, uh, light up. We know that it's, that there's a covenant picture being displayed, especially where that imagery is used in the book of Revelation, uh, that it was talking about the new covenant. So um, it's sad that they lean in on that, but then they seem to misapply it uh, in other regards. I'm interested, Edward, uh, did you glean anything from that video that you'd be interested in sharing? Yes, I felt everything was was truth up until that last part where, you know, um, where, where they said uh, Jesus is going to come back to, to fix everything. G that was his first mission <laughs> when he was born, you know, from that time. And then when he, when he started his ministry, you know, uh, at that point, th that, that was the healing. That was, you know, the kingdom and That's things nice. of this nature. Um, he, he did his job and then he said when he when he leaves he's going to send a comforter you know so that comforter and then he when he had said that we would do greater things you know um we are to continue his his mission um for the healing of the nations that's our job you know he gave us his spirit that we can do these things you know that we could trample on serpents and scorpions and things of this nature you know we have that power and authority you know, we're in the kingdom, you know, it's here, you know, uh, we pass from death to life, you know, we're living life, you know, we don't have to wait for, you know, the by and by to live life, you know, right. Christ had given it to us, you know, a while ago. <laughs> That's right. Well, now you got me curious. So are you a snake handler? <laughs> no, I'm not. All right. So obviously, you know, that we, we don't apply that. Let's be clear to everybody watching. We don't apply that literally. We understand yeah. that, you know, uh, Eve should have handled the snake, so to speak, uh, rather than, uh, you know, be deceived into, uh, you know, so again, if the de deception is of the mind, we would say the handling of the snake is of the mind too, that the serpent has no power over us. In other words, using that metaphor and that imagery appropriately, rather and than- And if we're to be the influence, if we're to be the influence, we're, we're not to be influenced. We're right. to be the one that influence. So okay. Eve should have, you know, held to what God had uh, given her the knowledge and wisdom of himself to where she should have stand, stood firm and, you know, rebuked the, uh, the serpent by giving him the enemy truth and don't stand there conversating with him. You know? That's right. Again, there's so much imagery there in, in Genesis. Yeah. I, I'd love to lean in on. We're going to, matter of fact, I'll make that announcement here at the end of our program today. Uh, so again, there, you're right, though. I, again, there's so much that could be drawn out for application and, and yeah. context to what we have in Christ. So I mentioned uh, another resource that I'm going to share on the po on the blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. Uh, again, we have a second Exodus on PPH blog. You click on that, it'll bring you through everything we've been talking about each podcast throughout this week. It'll also uh, provide for you the verses. And then underneath the verses, what I've been doing is sharing the resources. So for each verse that we brought up in the Old Testament, and then today summarizing and outlining the New Testament, uh, there'll be resources for further study. So uh, what that resource, though, that I'm going to be sharing as a sort of introduction to this topic, I found as I was doing some research, it said this, and I thought this was a great point. One way of describing the redemption through Christ Jesus is as a new and greater exodus. The telling of it is patterned after the exodus story, that there is a typological parallel between the historical exodus and the messianic salvation. Uh, and this is a part of a book, uh, The New Exodus of Salvation According to Paul. So again, these authors see these things and, and scholars across the board uh, see the parallel between the exoduses uh, and encourage people to study through it. So we hope we've uh, leaned in on that discussion a bit uh, with this, this week's dialogue. And uh, of course, with the uh, resource that we're going to put at thepowerofpreterism.com. 
another resource that I'm currently working through. Again, I believe that this has to be, if you really enjoy this topic, it has to be an ongoing study for you. Uh, we're going to conclude our outline today, if you will. Uh, but again, always be adding to that running resource. So if anybody ever wants to study it, has a question, we can always return back to that resource. But we encourage that as a sort of foundation. And uh, I've mentioned my sermon that I've preached on 2 Corinthians 3 through 5. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. And also uh, other resources that are found on the blog that are going to lead in on New Testament studies that I haven't had the chance to fully review again uh, would be Robert Cruikshank Jr.'s message on the millennium and the second exodus. Again, so he connects Revelation chapter 20 and the imagery being used there to, to the second exodus imagery. So uh, again, great, a great topic. Uh, that'll, the sermons are there on the Power of Preterism blog site. So uh, we went through the Old Testament, Edward. Are you ready to kind of jump in on some New Testament reading? And we'll obviously yeah. do this briefly. And on our way going to, to the New Testament uh, chapters um, and how, how, we, how we understand, like Daniel Rogers and yourself were saying, how the second exodus is throughout the scripture, uh, uh, Paul's uh, ministry was you know, to tra help transition from the old covenant to the new covenantal system. Right. So that's the second exodus in that regard, you know, right. teaching people the, the new covenant way of life. That's right. That is what you just said it very well. That sums up almost everything we've been saying. The apostles in the New Testament, uh, Paul, most specifically, we see taking that imagery and applying it to the messianic work of Jesus Christ. So, you know, that's where we need to keep it. And we need to understand how it applied to everything that was being done in that generation, in the time and nature that Christ said it would. Amen? Amen. So our first text that we marked down in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And again, as we're reading through these texts, pay attention, and I'm sure you'll notice it, uh, the allusions to the Exodus. When they had gone, again, this is they've left the uh, land of Israel to go into Egypt. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take this child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there, for I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, again, yesterday we talked a bit about this. Uh, Hosea chapter, uh, believe, I believe it's Hosea chapter 2. Um, but we talked quite a bit about the book of Hosea and the allusions to the Exodus. So I encourage people to go back and review some of those thoughts that we shared yesterday. And what we see happening here is Matthew is taking, first off, we have the prophet Hosea saying to his generation, using the imagery of the Exodus and helping them understand, uh, you know, that, that they, unfortunately, they had not gotten the, the, the idolatry of Egypt off of them. They came out and they were still in bondage to Egypt. Even though they're not in Egypt, they're still in bondage to Egypt. So now what happens is Matthew is taking that imagery that Hosea used and he's applying it to the birth of Jesus Christ. So here we see this Exodus imagery being used in application to Jesus Christ and what Christ was ultimately going to bring about, the hope of the prophets, the, pro the hope of what Hosea was telling his people in his time would one day come about. And if you do the study, uh, you know, through the book of Hosea, you get an excellent handle on what the hope of the resurrection was, which again was the restoration of Israel, uh, rather than, you know, restoration of the physical planet where there will be no physical death or crime, etc. cetera, uh, as unfortunately that video seemingly alluded to. So, so basically um, the Israelites um, being exiled and leaving Egypt, uh, still had Egypt within them due to their practices and their in their belief systems that they've adopted from the Egyptians. That's right. They need to be uh, cleansed from them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, following that theme, what we see happening as we lead up to the first century, you know, going all the way from, let's say, the time of Hosea, uh, you know, which I would mark out as one of the earlier prophets. So Hosea is trying to tell them, you have not gotten the muck of, you know, of uh, the Egypt's idolatry and influence worldview, if you will. Uh, we mentioned the series that we're currently studying through on Wednesday, where it's contrasting that 
Egyptian worldview with uh, what God was ultimately trying to develop within his people. And um, what we see happening is by the time of the first century, uh, rather than to really listen to the word of the prophets, uh, we see that Israel just continued to be obstinate and, and continued to go defy and, and build up traditions and build up external ways of saying that they were righteous rather than realizing the goal of the law, which is a text we're going to lead in on here in a moment. Uh, the goal of the law was to produce unrighteousness, to show them that they were unrighteous, not to produce unrighteousness, but to show them that they were unrighteous and that they were slaves to sin. So that being said, I want to show you a proof text to that. It's in John chapter 8. And again, we're going to see imagery. Remember, we've talked about the Exodus now. If you remember, uh, the Exodus, three things we were saying about the first Exodus was that it was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promises, that it was judgment upon Egypt for their idolatry and their obstinance against the things of God, and also um, judgment upon the gods of Egypt and obviously liberation of, of God's people. If you notice here in verse 31, John chapter 8, verse 31, to Jews that believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So again, here we have this freedom uh, thing that we've been highlighting as you know the goal of the Exodus is to bring the people from bondage to liberation. Then they answered him, notice this, we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? So again, here are these Jews that have built up these traditions, have demanded that they're the children of Abraham by their traditions, their own self-righteousness, and notice what Jesus says to them. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen my, in my father's presence, and you are doing what you have learned from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you are Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth from what I, that which I've heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You're doing the work of your father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are, are unable to hear what I say, because you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and a father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So again, uh, and obviously this enraged the Jews. So my point here is hopefully we saw the themes. We saw freedom. We saw promises to Abraham, right? We were talking about that. These Jews have developed traditions that have caused them to believe they are the inheritors of the promises to Abraham. Whereas what is Christ saying? Well, no, those that believe in my word, those that put their faith in me, those are the ones that inherit the blessing, the promise of Abraham to be set free. Amen? Yes. And that's why we alluded to, and I believe you mentioned this yesterday, that's why Jesus says, and it's cited in the Gospel of Mark, that by your traditions, you have invalidated the word of God. Amen. And, and they had the opportunity to, <clears throat> to be the children of Abraham if they would have followed Abraham's lead as far as he, he, uh, God found favor with him through his faith. Now, if they would have developed faith and had God in their heart, you know, then they would have had something to stand on. But being that they're, you know, that they're uh, putting their faith in their traditions instead of in God, you know, the works of their hands, you know, it invalidated, you know, the gospel. And uh, yes, 
Amen. And if I may, I wanted to bring up, I saw Richard had uh, sent a question uh, in that I think is worthy of uh, pointing out here that he said, doesn't this text say that Jesus was speaking to those that believed in him? And he's absolutely correct. Uh, obviously, John 8, 31, to the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said. So Jesus is saying this to those that are actually believing in his word. He's reminding them that they're still cleaving to their traditions. That again, we know there were many that believed in Christ and followed after Christ that through many trials and they did not persevere and they fell away. So again, here is a rebuke, almost a reminder, an exhortation to persevere, to not identify with the, that which was contrary to the things of God, the devil, the opposer, uh, but instead to you know heed the word of Christ. Again, hopefully you see the two contrasts, one which will keep you in bondage, the other that would, would be liberating, which is following the son. So uh, you know that's sort of what I'm seeing here. If I may, uh, I had found an article that I'll share on the website um, that talked about John 8 and it led in on this a bit. And it said, many passages in the New Testament reflect the Exodus pattern in the proclamation of deliverance. First, there are those passages which speak of sin as spiritual slavery. The Exodus pattern lies behind this concept, either consciously or unconsciously. Jesus said, everyone who makes a habit of committing sin is a slave to sin, John 8, 34. Paul told the Galatians, formerly, you were in bondage to beings that by nature are no gods in Galatians chapter four, which we'll actually talk about here in a moment. So again, my point being here in John eight, Jesus is giving two pictures, a picture of bondage, being sold to the devil, being slaves to sin and freedom, which again, we had highlighted freedom being highlight, being noted through the Abrahamic promises that God would you know, ultimately liberate people through his lineage. So uh, again, they obviously believe this applied to them as Jews, which we know the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians says that this applies to those that believe in Jesus Christ. And again, I do believe there's a difference between believing and falling away and believing and persevering, uh, having that persevering faith, if you will. Uh, so I, 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 I like um, how um, Jesus had, you know, you know, let them know that, you know, who, who their father was you know, the Pharisees, because um, them trusting in Abraham, uh, like they believed that, okay, that they, that they believed in God, you know, through the belief of Abraham, but Abraham, you know, you can't be saved through your parents. You know what I mean? You yeah. cannot be saved through your parents. It has to be an individual relationship with God. You know, they, they, like I said, they did not utilize why Abraham was the patriarch, in, the patriarch in which he was, because he was drawn by God and he obeyed God. You know, they didn't look at those concepts. They, they're looking at Abraham, you know, like I'm Abraham, see, I'm, I'm of his lineage, you know, so I get everything Abraham has. Right. You know, it just it doesn't work that way. You know, to get what Abraham has, you have to do what Abraham had done. You know what I mean? So, well, you know, and again, I, I would say that, yeah, I want to be careful with that because I also want to re recognize that in the book of Galatians, it's not only not what family you grew, you were in, it's also not what you do. You know, it's obviously exactly. what you look to and what he did. Amen. And, you know, so again, we know that that's a, a point that needs to be made for a lot of folks because, again, there is obedience, but the, the obedience we see all throughout the prophets that the heart is obe disobedient. And that the only one that can make it obedient is the work of the spirit, which again, the book of Galatians is highlighting uh, the Abrahamic seed is Christ. And that's those of the spirit, which again, if you follow the same argument from Galatians three into Galatians chapter five, where it talks about the fruits of the spirit, uh, it, it's basically encapsulating that entire point there. So, um, you know, again, so I think one of the issues is that, um, what we, we fail to realize in the church, early church, is that there were many that still cleaved to this old covenant understanding. Understanding it was a it was an issue that pervaded the church. Uh, we see that in Galatia. We see it in the Roman church. Uh, one of the texts I wanted to bring us to that we noted on the uh, site was Romans chapter seven, and uh, here in Romans chapter seven, again speaking to Jews. This is to Jewish Christians at the Church of Rome that are again this misunderstanding, this misapplication of the things of the law continued to be a problem. And here, I just want to read us through this a bit. It says, do you not know, verse one in Romans chapter seven, 
Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those that know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as the they are married. I'm sorry, as long as the person lives. For example, a law, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But her, if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you've died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. Again, seeing the correlation there between Galatians and Romans 7 is not that hard to, to notice. Um, continuing, for when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions, notice what he does here, the realm of the flesh is being under law. Mm -hmm. The sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And then he goes on to say, and if I may just point out, uh, actually we'll continue into verse seven. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have been known what coveting was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And then I'm going to stop there. The text does get into a bit more of a exhaustive explanation. But again, my point in bringing this text up is to show us that the Jews understood that they were being brought out from the law. That was the gospel. The gospel was bringing them out from under that tutor. Again, seeing Romans 7 in line with Galatians chapters 3 and 4 is very important. And seeing the, the, the parallel discussion that's going on. What Paul is explaining to Jewish Christians here, again, the same point that was being made there in John 8, uh, that, you know, that, that identity, that being under law, all that was, was to produce death. It was to produce the death in them so that they would see that in and of this natural covenant, which the Apostle Paul refers to it as in 1 Corinthians 15, that natural covenant would not produce righteousness. It, was the, it pointed to the new covenant, Christ, and that's where righteousness would be found. And this is where I see the second exodus as well. Like in verse 3 where it talks about, you know, uh, while her husband is alive, you know, she, uh, uh, she cannot marry another, you know, or she would be considered an adulteress, but if her husband dies. So basically, uh, while the law was in effect, you know, uh, you know, they were under the bondage of the law, however, but once the law was abolished, you know, or passed away, you know, which was like dead, uh, the new covenant, you know, had its place, um, the transition. Um, but my point being, um, yeah, you can't go back. You can't go, you know, you can't, okay, once something dies, you know, you, you know, you're free to remarry. You're free to go to the, to the new covenant. You know, you're not bound by the old covenant because the old covenant no longer has any power. You know, it, it, it was passing, it, it had passed. So therefore you, you are free to remarry and go into the new covenant, you know, you, you're not allowed to go back to the old. That's right. Again, and I think that's what the, the author of Hebrews, uh, when you really look at Hebrews there, I think that's what Hebrews is getting at. And again, uh, that's why Daniel Rogers had said, and I quoted him on this, the book of Hebrews is a new Exodus book. It, it basically gets in on exactly that point you're making there, Edward. And um, Hebrews was a book that we also outlined uh, as a text that we, uh, we should understand when talking about the, the new Exodus. So I want to encourage everyone uh, review the discussion we did with Daniel Rogers, where I feel he gave the best, most concise understanding of that Exodus. And also, um, and exactly what you were just pointing out, Edward, uh, about the law not going back. The, the author of Hebrews says things like that. You know, we should not turn back. Do not turn back to the things of the law, uh, which again, we know was the problem in Galatia as well. Well, Galatia, their issue wasn't necessarily about turning back to the law. Their issue was about imposing the law upon people that it did not, there, it was a misappropriation of the law.
I preached a sermon uh, by that title recently here at the Blue Point Bible Church as we're going through the book of Galatians. Uh, Edward, if you don't mind, I just want to uh, allude to the other texts that we brought up uh, on our site, and I'm not going to necessarily bring them us through them, but I just wanted to mention some things and then encourage further study, and I know that uh, Richard had, I think, wanted to enter in on our dialogue a bit, uh, and then maybe Zach and Vicky as well, so I just wanted to kind of run through these things and then uh, maybe open up discussion, obviously encouraging you to have some dialogue with me as I'm running through them, and then we'll bring everybody on. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, brother. Well, uh, again, so Romans 7, uh, I just want to share a note. I found this great blog where it talks about Romans, the chapters 5 through 8, and they allude to notes by N.T. Wright. That gives me great opportunity to mention uh, Dr. Don K. Preston has been doing a YouTube a session through uh, a resource by N.T. Wright. Uh, if you go to his morning musings, he's been going through it, I believe, for about two weeks now, and uh, he's been ongoing about creation, etc. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and go to Dr. Don K. Preston on YouTube and uh, glean some insight from him in that regard. But here, uh, th this site leans in on, uh, this website that I found, it leans in on this discussion about the second exodus and what we're reading in Romans chapters five through eight. And it says this, how does this theme work out? God promised Abraham he would undo the sin of Adam through him and his family. The initial fulfillment of the promise was the exodus from Egypt. Final fulfillment of the promise was to undo the sin of Adam in Christ. The result is, again, exodus, freedom, liberation from sin, the law, death. Chapter uh, Throughout the water in, in Romans chapter 6, you read about going through the water of baptism. The slaves get free, except now it is through the water of baptism of the Spirit rather than the water of the Red Sea. The gift of the Spirit is the Mount Sinai of Old Testament Exodus people of God are now on the way through the wilderness to their inheritance. This is what the book of Romans is all about. So again, it's alluding this, this quote. It seems like I might have copied something in there that made it a bit confusing. Either way, um, this text, and I encourage everyone to visit, I'll put it underneath Romans 7 uh, on our site. Uh, it, it helps you understand that new Exodus imagery being used in Romans chapters five through eight. So uh, that was one resource. I don't know if there's anything you found or know of in, well, we just talked about Romans seven. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there was anything else you felt you wanted to highlight in that regard, Edward, uh, regarding Romans chapters five through eight. Okay. I don't know how to connect it, but uh, how Daniel Rogers was talking about, like when you were mentioning baptism and, and, and uh, Israelites going through, you know, the Red Sea uh, being parted. Uh, Daniel Rogers had mentioned something about, you know, them being led by uh, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Right. I don't know how he kind of correlated it, but he kind of correlated that, you know, with the baptism and things of that nature in a sense. I'm not sure how he had did it or, or if he was correlating it or just making comparisons or however, but it was of some significance in that regard. Well, again, I do believe that during they were in the wilderness period, they were being given the spirit, which again was being brought through the, you know, the, the water, so to speak. Um, I, again, I, I don't necessarily agree with the church of Christ's rendering of the, the waters of baptism. So, uh, you know, that might be a discussion for another time, but I'm not remembering hundred percent what Daniel had said. However, I will say the new Testament authors do use that red sea imagery, apostle Paul, first Corinthians 10, uh, to apply to, uh, the time of the first century and the work of the spirit. So uh, that, that's when, and, and baptism for that matter. So there's nothing uh, remiss about that. How we might apply that and interpret that might be a bit different, but I think we're seeing the common theme. Yes. Uh, the, the next text that we had brought up was, uh, was the second Corinthians chapters three through five. And my point with second Corinthians three through five is if you understand what we've been saying up to this point, and then you go to 2 Corinthians 3 through 5, it would be impossible for you not to see the point that basically it's comparing the ministry of Moses, the fading glory of the old covenant with the coming glory of the new covenant. So now the point I often make and I, I try to bring up is, well, if we follow the Exodus theme, the Israelites didn't need new bodies in a new planet to understand their promise fulfilled when they entered into Egypt. Uh, you know, the point I often make is that when they entered into the promised land, there was still work to do, still battles to be fought. And they were still they were still sick and they still died. 
you know, but again, they understood the promises to be fulfilled when they were in the land. All the promises that were given, that's what the book of Joshua says, uh, were, were promised as they were in the promised land. So now in the new covenant, we, if we understand the ministry of Christ and we understand that he's overcome death and he's led us out of bondage, why do we unfortunately apply another point as we brought up at the beginning of this program? Why do we apply a yet future need for something else, another planet, another, you know, uh, new bodies, uh, the lack of physical death, when that's not necessarily what the promise was pointing to. So when you read 2 Corinthians 3 through 5, some have applied that to being, you know, you get a new body when you go to heaven, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, they often use and abuse. Um, and I make my point in that sermon, I believe that how it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and it's a covenant picture, not necessarily a bodily uh, story of, you know, your physical body versus your heavenly identity, but rather the, the carnal old covenant picture of the natural and then the spiritual being the new covenant. So uh, that resource is available for everyone to go ahead and listen to and review. Because may, may I give how I see uh, the passing of the Red Sea instead of the Dan, the Daniels, uh, his, his view, my view is, you know, them passing through the, through this, through the dry land, God guiding them, the spirit of God, and then a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night is them following the whole, the spirit, the spirit of God. That's right. Okay, well, amen. I, and I think most people would agree with that. I, I think we're, we're in agreement there. It's obviously the details and how they apply. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> and I think you're, you're applying that. I'm not sure what text you're applying that from. Uh, however, I would allude to 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter 10 as a, a text for that. Yeah, because clouds, clouds, you know, uh, God, God, God deals with clouds like um, the word air. For instance, it, 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 it can mean breath, it can mean air, it, these various things, and then the fire, fire kind of represents spirit. You know, yeah. this is kind of like how I'm connecting it in that regard. Yeah, well, again, I, I, as you know, I'm, I'm often be careful with connecting things out of sorts. You know, again, yes, no, I, oh, I know it can I, be very, and then, and then the other connection I was using in Genesis where the spirit um, hovered over the, the sea or whatever uh, in the beginning, how the spirit uh, hovered right, over. I follow you, but I know, like you said, it it can be dangerous. You know, with certain connections, but. Yeah, I follow you. I teach that, but I, I want to be. We're not. We're not talking about that right now. So you know, again, right. I want to be careful. Let's let's stay in the in the text here because mm -hmm. that's bringing us somewhere else into a different discussion. So here in Second Corinthians three through five, uh, we do see a transition of the covenants. Again, I, I'm not going to have enough time. We're already over our time to lead us in on that discussion. However, I encourage people as a foundation to review the sermon uh, that I had on that topic in regards to Galatians four, which was the next text that we marked out on the site. Um, I think we've led in on that discussion plenty. Matter of fact, this coming Sunday, I'm going to preach on Galatians chapter four, and uh, I've been leading into that. And what we're ultimately going to do is see a couple of texts. We're going to see Isaiah two, which was a part of a discussion I had with Sean Griffin. Uh, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12 and how that correlates to what we're, re we're reading about in Galatians chapter four, specifically the heavenly city. Uh, then Revelation chapter 21, which again, I think it's clear for us, the new Jerusalem, the city that comes from above. And then a text that I appreciate Zach leading in on that I'm going to actually include in my discussion is Joshua chapter five, because as we talked about, uh, you know, I, I believe the book of Galatians is responding to some misunderstandings regarding the uh, Joshua chapter five text. So uh, I look forward to kind of reviewing that and leading in on that this coming Sunday. And uh and then the last text, well, the two last texts we brought up were the book of Hebrews, which again, I mentioned before, uh, Tony Denton's resource on the book of Hebrews, a great insight that shows you the contrast of the covenants from flawed to fulfilled. And uh, then also Daniel Rogers the other day, uh, if you listen to our discussion with him, he outlined a good summary of the uh, Hebrews as well. So uh, I think those are two good foundational resources in regards to how Hebrews is outlining the contrast of covenants, the one covenant and the better covenant, the old va vanishing away covenant, Hebrews 8.13, and the coming covenant that was, was coming about. 
uh, that was being ushered in at that very moment. And then lastly, Revelation. Again, Revelation, uh, if you followed, again, this, this leads in on that exact point I made before. If you've been following along in this discussion and you find yourself reading the book of Revelation, uh, let's make a warning. You should never just read the book of Revelation and start trying to interpret things. Uh, what you need to do is become familiar with the biblical story up to that point. And when you understand that, that's why it's been placed at the end of your Bible, though I don't necessarily date it at the end of your, you know, the last book written. Uh, however, uh, the reason why Revelation was put at the end of the Bible was you kind of do need to have a good handling of the rest of the stuff that's going on. And by the time you get there, uh, you should understand the contrast of these two cities. Uh, you know, there's this, as Daniel marked out, there's a great city coming, up, coming under condemnation, and then there's a great city coming out of the sky from God. So when you get there and you understand Babylon is applying to one of those cities, the earthly city of Jerusalem, and then you understand the new Jerusalem, if you went to Galatians 4, which again, I'll be preaching on this Sunday, and you understood what's going on there, you all of a sudden understand Revelation. You understand that the, the consummation of the promise is this new Jerusalem, this, this reality of being with God, tabernacling with God. And that's what the second exodus should ultimately lead you to understand, is the fully consummated new covenant. It should not lead you to thinking that we need to be in another planet or again, if you've done this study and you've been following up to this point and actually doing the research, it would not lead you to that conclusion. So amen, because like you said, you have to go through, have, have a biblical narrative, like you have to know your Bible before you go to Revelation because, you know, you have a lot of scriptures that give you definition of a lot of what Revelation is saying, a lot of the language. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, uh, I just had it. Um, my mind is just getting blank. I'm well, sorry. Well, there's, well, again, you're absolutely right. Even though you, you, you may not have the example, you're absolutely correct that you need to go through the Old Testament to become familiar with things that are being mentioned in the New Testament. No doubt about it. You have to become familiar with prophetic literature, beasts, something we've covered on our program, uh, where you understand beasts as being understood through the prophet, Daniel particularly, and then you get to Revelation, now you start to understand what beasts are. You don't think of, you know, a crazy goblin coming out of the ocean. Uh, you begin to understand, you know, those details. So, yeah, I was thinking the bond woman, the bond woman representing Jerusalem, the, the earth, and then the free woman representing uh, the the new Jerusalem. You know, so to understand that, you know, then you can understand some parts of Revelation. You know, so you got to like kind of go back and forth in that regard. That's right. That's right. Well, brother, I think we, we, we've exhausted talking about the topics. Obviously, we're up against the time. What I'd like to do before I bring us in on a conclusion and uh, and share some announcements, I'm going to unmute some mics to see if there's anything in regards to the text that some, anybody would like to bring up. And uh, then we'll conclude with a summary and some announcements. I see I'm unmuted, so I'll go. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I raised my hand earlier because I wanted to play with the software. <laughs> and sometimes I see these buttons and I wonder what they're going to do, you know. Um, but actually, I, I was raising it because I didn't want to get past uh, the, the verse in John without making the comment that that, uh, that, that that those verses that you read in John are probably a very good lesson to uh, for people that are becoming Judaizers. Sure. Exactly what Jesus, you know, because one minute they they follow in him and the next minute he's calling them, you know, your father's the devil, you know. And uh, so it, it, that's almost like a, a good point by point lesson on how not to be a Judaizer. Uh, you know, that's what I wanted to say before we get off that verse. That was it. So I'm going to go to the next one that I wanted to say something. I was the, the one about marriage. It's very interesting. I was thinking about it and that verse has always kind of interested me. Because no focus was made on like, you know, even if he dies, she still was a lustful woman that, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, that was kind of like all forgotten because of the loss of the flesh, the, the breaking and the loss of the fleshly covenant. Jesus was saying, you know, you've got to free yourself from the covenant of that flesh, mm -hmm. which, of course, the Jews had it so tied into, you know, the, their flesh. And here Jesus is saying that, you know, I don't know if I'm making myself clear because it was clear when it came into my head, but um, 
there's, there's a fleshly covenant just by somebody dying. The fleshly covenant is broken. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was kind of telling the Jews, this whole fleshly thing that you have is over. It's dead. You know, yeah. it's no longer about the flesh. It's about the spirit now, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the only two things I'll say with that. And then I'll shut up. Uh, Thanks. Amen. Amen. Yeah, a good point there. And obviously there's a lot of discussion in preterist circles in regards to uh, how strong and what was standing in regards to the law in the first century. I'm sure you've probably saw some ongoing discussions in that regard, Richard and Edward as well, uh, that, um, you know, where obviously I hold to a view uh, probably more in line with Don Preston, where the law was being understood as binding up till AD 70, whereas some have come to the view that at the cross, the law was completely done away with. Um, you know, there seems to be uh, different nuances there. Uh, but again, I think that we can all agree uh, with the ultimate view of this text showing that the law was no longer the the effectual means to attain, uh, to even identify with the promises of Abraham or to identify with, uh, you know, the, what the law was pointing to. Um, that was no longer the holding to that identity under the law was no longer it. And that's what I believe Paul is getting at in, in Romans 7, Galatians 4, uh, a lot of other texts uh, in that regard. John 8, John 8, as you rightly just pointed out as well. Good deal. Well, uh, again, we everybody's unmuted. Uh, if anybody has anything you want to jump in and share uh, in this regard, obviously today is going to be our concluding uh, day on the second Exodus. So uh, we're hoping to just kind of create this as a, a resource for others to continue to review and study through, uh, if not listening to us and listening to the great things that I hope we unearth in our study, uh, at least visiting the power of preterism.wordpress to glean the, uh, from the resources that are shared there. All right, brother. Well, I, I don't think, uh, I think that everybody feels as though we've exhausted it as well. And uh, that being said, do you have anything you want to share uh, before I bring us to a close? Just thank you and God bless everyone. <laughs> All right. Amen, brother. Well, before we go that far and start saying God bless, I got a bunch of announcements. So we got a little bit of time <laughs> to borrow from you. If you will, yeah. if I, I shared, a, I wrote an outline on every day you would imagine as we go through this, I ask myself, you know, what are we trying to say? What are we getting at? And you know, I'm very big on effective communication. So uh, that being said, I wrote a sort of summary that I'm going to be sharing uh, on social media uh, in this regard. And this is what I wrote. Gaining an understanding of the second exodus of the scriptures, namely by paying attention to the way the biblical writers utilize exodus language, enables us to better understand or better realize all that has been provided through Christ, the greater Moses, the greater Joshua. Through his finished work, Jesus Christ has led us into the promised land, eternal life. We are not in exile, nor are we in transit. We have arrived. That being our spiritual reality, we have many opportunities, battles, and burdens, and more to experience as we live in the land of the Lord, the new covenant, just as the old covenant Israel, just as old covenant Israel did when they entered their promised land. So again, for me, that's my, my sort of summary of this topic, uh, that when we fully understand what it all pointed to, we arrive at understanding that we are in the kingdom, we are in the promised land, we are in the new heavens and new earth, and ultimately we are doing the work that we read about there in Revelation 21 through 22, as Edward alluded to right there at the beginning of the program, the, the healing of the nations. It's our job. We're a part of that reality. God is tabernacling with us, and we're in it. We're in it. We've won. We're victors, as Vicky, uh, Vicky would have me say. Uh, we're the winners uh, of the story. Praise be to God. Amen. If I may, i offer up a flashback, Flash Forward Friday, um, here for the Power of Preterism Network, uh, which ultimately you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Uh, that website tells you about our ministries and our efforts. Edward, you're one of our board members uh, for the Power of Preterism Network. I'd like to thank you for your efforts in that regard. We're working on our own board meeting uh, coming up this coming Monday, so you're going to see quite a bit being developed through us and uh, hopefully in us and through us and uh, in that regard. For the Preterist Power Hour, just to give everybody uh, some insight in regards to what we're planning for weeks ahead, uh, next week we're, we're going to do random topics. So that will be up to Edward and I to be attentive and diligent in uh, things that we're learning about in regards to preterism. If those of you that tune in uh, have a topic you want us to cover, uh, we'll lean in on that. And that'll be from the 24th to the 28th. And then on the 31st, 
uh, which will be our board meeting, we're also going to, uh, that morning, we're going to talk about leadership. And throughout the week, we're going to welcome leaders from the Blue Point Bible Church, leaders from the Power of Preterism Network, leaders in the Preterist movement as a total, uh, as a whole, and uh, welcome them to come join us and share insights on leadership. And uh, then the following week, as we move into February, that will be the first week of February. Uh, following that, we will have random topics from the 7th to the 11th, and uh, different guests and topics and different things will be planned accordingly. And then on the 14th of um, February, we're going to begin our series of looking at covenant creation and looking at creation through the lens of a preterist. And uh, we'll probably be considering a couple different insights as we've off, we've already led even with Richard in our discussion, uh, led in on some different things that need to be uh, discussed and unearthed. Prayerfully, that will be beneficial and a blessing to many. We have many guests that we're going to be inviting on uh, to talk about those things. And then the last announcement I'll make in regards to the Preterist Power Hour is um, is at the end of February, moving into March, we're going to focus on the local church, uh, the value of what, are, what we as preterists are saying about church. Uh, we're also going to host our uh, renewed, uh, the, the Preterist Pastors Network conference call, uh, which is a ministry through the, Preter, uh, the Power of Preterism Network. And uh, we'll be doing more in that regard. So you'll, you'll get to hear more about that from me. I'll be sharing more. And of course, uh, if you visit the websites that I've mentioned, you'll get much more insight in that regard. Uh, and of course, please, if you're on social media, go ahead and like the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page. Uh, it helps us obviously uh, get more to get you updated and also uh, to get noticed a bit more as well. Um, we're moving into the weekend. Uh, I know here at the Blue Point Bible Church, we have many Bible studies and worship opportunities available uh, in person and online. Um, what we're, we're working on through the Power of Preterism Network is a resource page for people to gain the same blessing and insight that I feel I do, we do here at the Blue Point Bible Church throughout the week. So we want to offer up opportunities for in-person and online uh, people for people all over the United States. So uh, you can look forward to that being available at thepowerofpreterism.com. Uh, that'll be a, a resource page there on our site. Uh, we're constantly in communication with other preachers and, and building up a network where people can be blessed through what we call the power of preterism. Uh, a couple of things that I, I want to mention that I'm excited to announce. The first one would be there's an upcoming debate. Uh, if I can pull up my graphics here. Uh, Edward mentioned earlier about the importance of AD 70, and that excited me because I knew about the announcement I was going to be able to share at the end. So there's a debate coming up in Indiana between John Watson and a preacher named Eric Gershbacher. And then I guess Steve Bazin is going to be joining in on the following day uh, to debate uh, Eric Gershbacher uh, in regards to uh, AD 70. Has Jesus already returned? He, will he come in the future? And this is February 19th through the 20th. Uh, this will be at the Pantheon Theater, as you see here on the screen in Vinci, I think I'm pronouncing it appropriately, Vincennes, Indiana. And uh, for those of you that are not going to be able to be there in person, it will be live and online. As I've often made known, uh, my goal is to highlight uh, you know, resources that could be made available online and anything I try to be a part of, I try to find ways for us to live stream it. So uh, this will be available for you. Uh, obviously it will be a debate proving whether or not Jesus Christ will come in the future or if he had indeed came in that first century in AD 70, uh, in the events at least of 66 to 70 AD. So that's the first announcement I have for you. The second announcement is something that I've been previously mentioning. Uh, that is the conference happening in Roger, Rogersville, Tennessee. That will be March 20. 6th through the 27th. I'm going to go ahead and share that graphic with you here on the screen. This will be the Rethinking Resu the Resurrection uh, Conference. Daniel Rogers will also be there, who you heard from more recently. Uh, he'll be there on March 26th, speaking in the morning. I'll be speaking later that evening. And uh, this is, again, the Spring Conference of the Holston PBU Church. Uh, they are a preterist church, and that is in Rogersville, Tennessee. So uh, those details are available on the Power of Preterism WordPress site and uh, will be shared throughout our website, our Facebook page as well. Uh, that's March 26th through the 27th. And now today I'm able to officially uh, announce the dates for the, the conference that's going to be in Chalcedonia, Mississippi, and that will be April 23rd through the 24th. I will be one of the speakers there as well as, 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 all, as, well as Ward Fenley 
Uh, he'll be one of the, pre uh, the, the speakers there at that conference in Mississippi. Uh, you can contact Tony Gallup uh, to learn more information about that conference. And I'll be sharing graphics and different details leading up to April 23rd through the 24th as well. And one last announcement I'll make because my voice is clearly going out. Uh, and let me pull up the graphic is the Virginia Beach Bible Church Conference. And I have not had the opportunity to go there in a while. And I know they always have their uh, stuff available online. Uh, they're telling you to make your plans now for the How Shall We Then Live, a spring 2022 Bible conference that will be April 29th to May 1st. So quite a bit, you know, to keep up with and conferences that are happening. Uh, things are a happening. And praise be to God in that regard. So um, that's what we have. I've also reached out to Dr. Don K. Preston and asked him to uh, update me if there will be a 2022 Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. And I'll get that information to everyone uh, as we, uh, we see it. So that's what I have for announcements. I'm grateful for each of you being a part of our session this morning. Uh, thank you, Edward, of course, for your diligence and your desire to be here and do this program with me. And I look forward to random topics next week where we could just kind of talk about some of the things we're seeing as powerful in preterism. Please get let me know some topics that you find interesting. I also tell those of you that are viewing here in our discussion uh, on Zoom or calling, let us know topics that you want us to look into and talk about, and we'll uh, find the time to get to them. Thank you again. I pray that each of you have a blessed weekend, and I'll go ahead and close us out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you that, as your word says, you have given everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. We thank you, Lord, that you are the greater Moses, the greater Joshua, a he who brings us into the land and leads us through the land victoriously. Lord, remind us of the, the wisdom that we read in the Proverbs, where we read that the, the battle does not belong to the might of man, no matter how strong we think we are, no matter how much we might think we prepared appropriately, or our vision is of you, Lord. We know it's you that are the victor in battle. So may we desire to recognize your sovereignty in all that we do. May this teaching on the second exodus lead us further in our understanding of your sovereignty, Lord. And may we continue to see it applied as we uh, journey through this, this beautiful kingdom and provide healing uh, to those that are in need. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. God bless. God bless.